Julia, good morning. Keller. Camilla, keep your jewel to yourself. Charlotte, Amy Claire, Easley, Towns, like those socks. Good morning, everybody. Does anybody notice anything different about me this morning? Uh, you have a backpack. You have a backpack. You have a backpack. You have a backpack. Oh, thanks, crew. But Sweet. you have a backpack. I do have a backpack. What do you think I have in my backpack? I do have a butterfly. Hey, Lily, you want to come over here with us? You're going to hang out there. Okay. <laughs> so, I had Emmy, Claire, and crew pack me a backpack this morning. What do you think they put in here for me? A snack. Ooh, look at this. An, an action figure? Of you. Of you let's, let's see. I've got a jacket in case I get cold. Yeah, we pack that for you. Thank you. I have a rain jacket that doesn't belong to me. Good. What else is in here? Oh, thankfully I've got a pair of shoes here. And, oh, a pair of underwear. <laughs> I guess I, oh, I have a walkie-talkie to call somebody. This is great. Yeah, oh, I have two shoes? Yeah. Do you guys think that much of this stuff's going to help me? You think these will help me on my trip? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about these shoes? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What is it? Oh, thank you. I have two shoes. So, oh, good. I've also, oh, you guys did pack me some money. Yeah. Okay. What is it? You did pack me a water bottle and a snack? Oh, thank you. I, well, I think we're good now. I think my illustration's been made. Take out your snack. Take out your snack. Okay, I'll get my snack later. Oh, I got some socks? Okay, good. All right. So, what do you think most people do when they have a bag packed like this? What do you think they're doing? Yes, Keller. Hiking and camping. Ooh, hiking and camping. Ooh, they're being prepared. I like that. Yes. The yes, that's right. So, yes, Charlotte. If they get hungry, they can get out food. Ooh, if they get hungry, they can get out food. And I said the other one. That's you. We are. So, you know, a lot of of what we learn in the Bible is about going on journeys and missions and sharing the good news of God. Did you know that? So, you know, in the story of Jonah, Jonah's got a really hard job. He's supposed to go on a journey and tell the people of Nineveh that they're doing some really bad stuff and they need, they need a change. But in the New Testament, we encounter, who do we encounter in the New Testament? Do you all know? God. And? Jesus. Jesus. So, this is interesting. Jesus tells us in Mark when we go on a journey... What do you think Jesus tells us to bring on our journey? What do you think Jesus tells us to bring? Yes, crew. Um, <laughs> a jacket. He actually, Jesus says you only need one jacket when you go. Yes. Um, to bring love. Yeah, well, he doesn't say that in this part, but that's a good answer. To bring love. No, no. Amy Claire? To bring hope. Oh, that's a good one. Hope and love are good things. Oh. Thanks, Camilla. Hope. Yes, Charlotte. He brings snacks. Ooh, well, it doesn't say that here. So the, ah. the interesting thing about this passage ah. is that Jesus tells us that we need to bring shoes, a walking stick, and a shirt. Yeah. That is a great question. Why? Because Jesus is teaching us to have faith, the same faith that Jonah needed to go out and, and share the love and the word of God. But Jesus wants us to go out in faith. But most important, what do you think Jesus wanted us to do when we went out into the world? To be kind. Ooh, nice. I like that kind. To be helpful. So I would say the thing that we learn most about Jesus is Jesus is wanting us to connect. And we can't build connections unless we meet people and we learn about them. And sometimes we get so overpacked with everything in our lives. We don't ask other people for help. Yeah. And sometimes we love our stuff so much, what do we do? We, we don't. We, we like, we, yes, we, right. I know, I know, I know, I know. We get greedier. We don't want to share it. So, 
So as we go out into the world, we should be trying to connect so we can share the love of, of God, and we should also be willing to share to show that we have an abundant and faithful God who loves us. The nights are getting longer, right? Have you noticed that? I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'm sure you were expecting it as well. Uh, the nights are getting longer, and uh, uh, you know this uh, fall season um, is often referred to as a season of shadows because of the lengthening of the shadows and the shortening of the daylight and the lengthening of the nights. Um, and you know, there's just something about this season that is so, so very special, um, it feels for me. Um, you know, these long days of summer and sunshine are really great, no doubt about that. However, there is something about the fall um, with its le lengthening uh, nights. Uh, autumn sets a, a mood. Uh, it's an enchantment uh, in a lot of ways. Of, uh, there's something that happens to us psychologically, I think, uh, in the fall uh, as well. Um, you know, we couldn't live with constant daylight, right? Um, constant daytime, constant uh, summer. Um, we would be scorched. Uh, there would be no life on this planet if it were uh, constant light. Uh, we need the balance uh, that autumn brings uh, with its darkness, night, uh, and its shadows. Um, its transition to the deeper sleep of winter uh, as well. You know, I've come to see when I... Uh, when I'm reading scripture and when I see something there that I had not seen before, that I really didn't expect uh, to see there, um, once I see it, I begin to see it everywhere <laughs> in the scriptures and in the stories. Um, and that's true for me of this holding together of uh, light and dark. Um, scripture is actually full of it, the holding together of light and dark. Um, and that may be surprising to some. Um, after all, isn't the spiritual life supposed to be one of tri our light triumphing over darkness, of purity and perfection triumphing over our sin and our faults? <clears throat> I really don't think that's what it's about. <laughs> Richard Rohr says that the search for the perfect is usually the enemy of the truly good. And Carl Jung, uh, that great uh, psychologist of uh, archetypes and uh, panpsychism, he said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. So this metaphor of light and dark is a much more complex metaphor than we usually consider it to be. It speaks so much more deeply um, than just good and evil and uh, the differentiation uh, of those. We see it from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, there's only dark. There's only the darkness. And so God said, let there be light. And notice, though, that God does not banish the dark in favor of the light, but separates the light from the darkness, calling the light day and the darkness night. To be forever held in the dance of evening uh, and sunrise. And notice too that God does not call the separation of light and darkness, night and day, good. As he calls the rest of creation. They must be held together in balance. They are only different aspects of the same thing. They only have meaning in relationship to one another. There's no meaning to light if we do not know the dark. There's no meaning to the dark if we do not hold out the light as well. And this is the very dance <clears throat> that has enabled the evolution and the flourishing of, of life on this planet. Night and day, winter and summer, fall and in spring. And I also see this theme in uh, this reading today from Jonah. Uh, the story of Jonah in the dark belly of the whale. And in fact, uh, in reading it, the whole book of Jonah is replete with imagery that implies darkness and light. And by the way, mostly darkness in this book of Jonah. God speaks 
summoning Jonah to go at once to Nineveh to cry out against their dark wickedness. But Jonah instead boards a boat to flee to Tarshish. And I find it interesting, I didn't know this before this week, but um, the word Tarshish, the, the name Tarshish, the word actually means contemplation and self-examination. Jonah flees <laughs> the call of God, but flees to contemplation. And contemplation is always a looking inward, again implying uh, light and dark. And looking inward not just to find the spark, the true light of God within us, but also to discover and examine the shadows within us as well. And then a great dark storm appears, threatening uh, the ship. And the sailors find Jonah sleeping in the hull of the boat. Another darkness within uh, kind of metaphor, if you will. And so the sailors finally discern that it is uh, Jonah's flight that is the cause of the storm. <laughs> and uh, the storm that has grown darker and more powerful still and now threatens their very lives. So in fear that his doom might become their own, they toss Jonah uh, overboard uh, into the ocean. And I love the way it says this. Uh, it says, uh, God provided. <laughs> God provided. God will provide, right? Um, the refuge of uh, pious uh, sentiment. God will provide. Yes. But sometimes what is provided is a big fish <laughs> that will swallow us whole. <laughs> and Jonah is in the dark belly of his fish for three days and three nights. Have you ever been in the dark belly of the whale? A big fish that the great ocean of life has sent your way? Well, if you haven't, then just wait. <laughs> it will come along. I've been reading uh, Richard Rohr's uh, book about male initiation. Um, it's called Adam's Return, The Five Promises of Male Initiation. Um, he used to do a whole program, and uh, an outdoor program in male initiation. He has turned that over to another organization of late, um, but he, has, he did a lot of study and has done a lot of work in this field. And in studying the initiation rites of many, many cultures over many, many histories, he, he identifies five lessons, or what he calls promises, that are common to most, or if not all, of those initiation rites. This is the lesson that they hope to teach the young uh, man who is transitioning from uh, youth into manhood. Life is hard. <laughs> you are not important. Your life is not about you. You are not in control. You are going to die. Now, they may seem odd to our Western and kind of modern sensitivities. Why these lessons when the child is transitioning to adulthood? Might this interrupt the, you know, the sense of uh, confidence in themselves that they need to uh, move forward? But what these actually are are an invitation to let go of a false sense of power and entitlement and immortality and self-centeredness in order to find and begin to nurture a more authentic self. A self that really associates with life as we know it. The interesting thing about Rohr's programs is that he, did, he was not working with teenagers moving from childhood to adulthood. He was working with adult men who had never been initiated. And because of that, we're living out the consequences of not being initiated and not having that deeper view of themselves and of life. And he argues that a society full of uninitiated men is a society of egotistic narcissism. I won't say anything else about that. 
And these initiations that he studies were invariably performed in nature because only nature can present to the initiate something greater than themselves. And so the ordeal also involved hardships and deprivations and trials and fears, but fears faced up to, not fears ignored and long, long nights alone. You know, it just occurred to me reading this passage this morning that Jonah, when he calls out to God, says that God has answered me in his temple. Well, he's not in the temple. He's in the belly of the well, <laughs> which seems to imply that all of nature is, in fact, God's temple. And Jonah describes his own ordeal as in the belly of Sheol, or the pit, which is the dark underworld, the realm of the dead. He has been cast into the deep, the heart of the seas, below the waves and billows of life, the deep surrounds him. I sank to the very base of the mountains, the bars of the earth enclosed upon me forever. And yet it is there, there at the bottom, there in the realm and clutches of death, that Jonah calls to mind and calls on the Lord. But he does so with a new realization. And this is actually a closer translation to what we read this morning. They who cling to empty folly forsake their own welfare. I will offer myself to something greater. I will offer myself to the Lord. And so the Jonah that the fish spews up on dry land <laughs> is in many ways a new man. Um, he's been reborn. Not a perfect man. <laughs> uh, he still has his shadows to sort and address, and that in fact is what the second half of the book of Jonah is about. Yet his flight to contemplation has redirected his life's journey. And this is per the perennial form, the perennial um, lesson that we get again and again in Scripture. This is exile and return. This is death and resurrection. This is the form of spiritual questing that our Hebrew and Christian tradition gives to us. We cannot experience resurrection and fullness without also going through death and some experience that challenges our whole sense of who we are and what life is about. When they ask Jesus for a sign, give us a sign that what you're saying is right. What does he say? He says, you'll receive no sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. <laughs> the pattern of death and resurrection. So we as a society have lost um, the ancient practice of initiation largely. Uh, for both boys and girls. Um, Rohr talks about girls not having to go through the same kind of uh, initiation because life has already taught them those hard lessons. <laughs> and what they need is an initiation then that can help them integrate that in positive ways in their life uh, that affirm uh, them uh, as people. And there are, of course, other transitions in life, too, that should be marked and initiated. And in fact, we are in the process here at Christ Church of, initi of initiating a program that in fact will attend to these very things. The good news here though, even though we don't do initiations, and most of us probably haven't been formally initiated, the good news is that life itself will initiate us if we let it. Life is full of such big fish and sooner or later they will swim our way. The problem is that we tend to want to avoid or manage or escape our seasons of darkness rather than allow them to teach and to grow and to mature us. Rather than trust the long gestation to form us, we abort our own new birth. And understand, I'm not talking here about standing bravely in the face of our suffering and struggles. I'm not even talking about our faith triumphing 
over the darkness. I'm not talking about being or becoming perfect. The dark seasons of our life will come and will expose also our shadows, our imperfections. That's part of the journey. That's part of the transformation. That's part of the new birth. And invite us finally to embrace our humanity with all of its incompleteness. That's really our problem, you know. It's not sin and judgment. Our problem is being incomplete. Not being fully human as we are created uh, to be. In hope of becoming a little more free, a little more full, a little more whole along the way. So look around you. The leaves are falling. The green is retreating. The shadows are lengthening. What a glorious season this is. Preparing us for the hard winter. The natural transition that leads to the new birth of spring's glorious light and life. And this is the round in which we are created. And this is the round which we are invited to live. Mm -hmm.